What we did was, was a secret thing. The soil of a man's heart, oh, this is stony heart. Like the soil up there in the old make my burn ground. Sometimes, that is not a... Good evening, Constant Reader. Tonight, we will be examining the events within one of Stephen King's darkest novels through the lens of a true crime-styled podcast. So, if you don't want the disturbing details of the plot to be revealed, then you shouldn't continue down this path any further. Still here? Good. In May of 1984, just as the damp spring of New England was about to dry into a bright and cheerful summer, a house fire disturbed an otherwise tranquil dawn. It was the home of Judd Crandall. The old-timer had lived here all of his life, and he had died here. The residents of Ludlow, Maine, at first assumed that the fire was caused by accident. Judd was, after all, in his mid-80s. He had recently lost his wife, Norma, and he was a chain smoker. So many folks guessed that he had lit a Chesterfield and fallen asleep in his living room. However, it did not take long for investigators to detect signs of arson. But there are those who believe that Judd Crandall was playing with more than just matches. There are some who say that Judd Crandall was meddling with a malevolent and unnatural power that lurked in the woods just beyond the town proper. A power, they say, that was more like a curse. And apparently, it is all connected to a little patch of ground tended by neighboring children and marked by a misspelled sign that reads Pet Cemetery. To understand why some townsfolk believe that Judd Crandall was a necromancer, we need to look to the past. Judd was born at the start of a new century in the year 1900, but to truly understand the murders that took place not just on Judd's property, but on his neighbors, we must go back even further. Before the days of European explorers and fur trappers, the land of this area was home to the Mi'kmaq Indian tribe and other native peoples. The forest and hills in this part of the country were said to be sacred, and though it has yet to be discovered by modern-day archaeologists, it is believed that somewhere in the wilderness that borders Ludlow, Maine, there is an ancient burial ground, and according to legend, that burial ground soured into an unholy place. For perhaps hundreds of years, the Mi'kmaq buried their loved ones here, and even their animal companions. It has been said by locals that the Mi'kmaqs believed this hill was a magic place. They made this place and buried their dead here, away from everything else. Other tribes stayed clear of it, and claimed that these woods were full of ghosts. Later, French and British fur trappers began to make similar claims about evil spirits in the night. 
these rumors, perhaps too vague to even be called a legend, contend that something called a Wendigo touched this place. According to American Indian horror stories, Wendigos are evil, man-eating giants. They were once human, but have been cursed, punished for the sin of gluttony, selfishness, or the worst crime, cannibalism. They were transformed into malevolent beings doomed to walk the woods, and they say the original human form is still locked within this monstrosity, curled up and frozen in a fetal position, trapped in the place where the Wendigo's heart should be. Now for the Micmac, instead of a burial ground that would grant eternal rest, this patch of land would now awaken the dead, and what would rise would no longer be human or even animal, but would be a shell of its former self animated by evil spirits ready to do the bidding of the Wendigo. Throughout the 1800s, the American children growing up in the area would have shared these superstitions with one another, growing them, enhancing them, altering them, and these warped versions of Micmac and Algonquin mythos merged into a story about how something in the ground could bring a dead thing back to life. By the late 1800s, the children of Ludlow established their own pet cemetery. Eventually, the road that would become Route 15 became flooded with horses and carriages and would become even more crowded with the birth of the Model T Ford. The result was a highway between two industrious towns and a disturbing surge in roadkill. For solace and finality, more and more children of the community turned to the local pet cemetery. But there were some who believed that there was a pathway that led beyond the pet cemetery into the wilderness to the original lost Micmac burial ground. Local drunks would claim that if you carried your pet through a dark place called Little God Swamp and plant the body of your animal into a stony plot of ground and then build a cairn upon the grave, you could bring your beloved pet back to life. A fur trader by the name of Bouchard may have been the first Anglo settler to discover the burial ground. He was famous for traveling in a wagon adorned with hundreds of crucifixes, but he also adorned his wagon with pagan symbols, as if to hedge his bets. Bouchard became one of the wealthiest men in the county, and in the local saloon, after a few whiskeys, he preached about the coming resurrection. He would tell anybody who would listen to him that all Indians were hellbound, but that their magic worked. Apparently, in his many tradings with the Micmac, they told old Bouchard about the abandoned burial ground and about the curse. This knowledge was passed from father to son and grandson, and with each generation, rumors increased that the Bouchards dabbled in black magic, that every once in a while a dog or a goat owned by the Bouchards would be found dead along a dirt road, and then, a few days later, that animal would be seen again, alive and perhaps not well but alive nonetheless. Of course, the logical explanation was that that animal hadn't been dead at all, merely sick, and that its zombie-like behavior was a result of a prolonged illness. And so the adults had their version of events, and the young people had theirs. 
By the time Stanny Bouchard, the grandson of the old fur trapper, entered adulthood himself, the family fortune had dwindled into a pittance. Stanny became a wandering rag salesman, always intoxicated and tormented by a dying liver. But ever so often, he still took pleasure in whispering the secret of the burial ground, sometimes even leading children into the forest by the light of an autumn moon. One such child led astray may have been none other than Judd Crandall. Born in the year 1900, in a house built by his father, the house which would later burn down in 1984, Judd was a good-natured only child who loved playing marbles and palling around with his loyal dog, Spot. His father worked on the railroad, a career path Judd would one day follow himself. When Judd was 10 years old, his dog chased a rabbit into a tangle of barbed wire, resulting in a deadly infection. Judd's father, Dan Crandall, put the dog out of its misery. However, folklore tells us that the next day, Spot was back, a little slower, a little stranger, but still alive. And in the place where there should have been a bullet wound, now there was merely an indentation and a circle of fur turned white. Spot was not the only pet believed to have turned. Over the years, the townsfolk would notice certain commonalities. Some pets would smell like spoiled meat. Their movement became jilted, clumsy, the touch of these so-called resurrected animals was said to be revolting. Some cats who had been benign before, perhaps even friendly, were now seen disemboweling rodents and birds. In 1914, Spot died for a second time, if superstition is to be believed, and his bones now rest somewhere near that misspelled sign in the hills. In 1967, it has been said that a prized bull named Hanratty was dragged up to the secret burial ground and came back to life. It is unclear if this resurrected bull had been owned by Zack McGovern or Lester Morgan, but by all accounts, townsfolk claim that the bull had dropped dead in its field, only to be seen alive again and now it had become aggressive, so much so that it injured itself by charging into trees. The owner had to put the animal down for good this time. And yet, despite the mayhem connected with the bull, it was said that when Mrs. Levesque's pet chow passed away, she was so grief-stricken that she begged Lester Morgan to show her the way to the burial grounds, and reportedly, days after the vet had put the animal to sleep, that chow was back to life, chasing postal employees. All of this is hearsay thus far, and all of this thus far has been about animals, but it must have made some wonder whether or not such sorcery could work on a person. And these quandaries culminated with the arrival of Timmy Baderman's remains, delivered to Ludlow's train station in 1943 during the height of World War II. Timothy Baderman died a hero, attempting to take out a machine gun nest along the road to Rome. His actions earned him the Silver Star. His death must have been devastating to his father, William Baderman, who had already buried his wife and their second born, both dead due to childbirth complications. On July 22, 1943, Timothy's body was allegedly buried in Pleasant View Cemetery. Nearly half the town attended the funeral service. However, 
Five days later, Timothy was spotted walking towards the livery stable in town. His skin was pale, his hair wild. Days passed and Timmy Baderman was spotted several other times, usually wandering the road, sometimes walking back and forth all day long. People said his eyes looked as dead and dusty as marbles. By the end of July, the War Department had received several anonymous letters from concerned Ludlow residents. Skeptics and government officials suspected that Timothy Baderman hadn't been killed in Europe after all. But could he have faked his death and traveled by coffin across the Atlantic? The truth was never made clear. Before the War Department could send investigators to Ludlow, the Baderman house was burned to the ground, arson set by range oil. The coroners examined the bodies of William and Timothy Baderman. The son had been shot twice in the chest, then laid on the bed. And yet, the autopsy report claimed that Timothy Baderman had been dead for at least two weeks. The father had apparently taken his own life with the pistol, but not before setting fire to his own home. Perhaps William Baderman had begun to believe that his son wasn't just suffering from PTSD. Perhaps he began to believe the town's gossip that Timothy Baderman had been touched by the Wendigo, and that the ghostly light in his pale eyes needed to be extinguished once and for all. Decades passed in Ludlow, Maine, blissfully uneventful. Judd Crandall and his wife Norma watched the years roll by from their porch. And though the town's gossip would have you believe that Judd occasionally visited a brothel, his marriage to Norma seemed to be happy, albeit childless. And so, when the Creed family moved in during the late summer of 1983, Judd Crandall took a shine to them. And in the young doctor, Louis Creed, Judd seemed to find the son he had never had. The Creeds had moved from Chicago, hoping to experience life away from the big city. Lewis and his wife Rachel also hoped that their children, Eileen and Gage, would be able to thrive in a more rural environment. Lewis had recently accepted a position as head administrator of the local university's medical ward a job that should have been comparatively easy to his years in the emergency room. But on the first day of classes, a young jogger named Victor Pascal was struck by a vehicle. Students brought the young man into Dr. Creed's clinic, but it was too late. It was a devastating way to begin the semester. But as the weeks passed, Dr. Creed seemed to snap out of it, normality returned, and he refocused again on work and family life. Life seemed good, even for their cat, Winston Churchill, who had to be fixed in order to prevent him from wandering across the busy road. The seasons passed, and the Creed settled into school and work and a mild social life. Their life in Ludlow must have seemed blissful until May of 1984. An Arinko truck driver was headed to Bangor, and according to the police report, the driver felt a sudden urge to accelerate. He did not see two-year-old Gage Creed running into the road until it was too late. The child died instantly. This, of course, would be an unimaginable nightmare for any family. But for the Creeds, things were about to get worse because within five days, little Eileen Creed would become the last surviving member of the Creed family. Here is the timeline as we know it. On May 13th, 1984, the life of Gage Creed was cut short 
by a speeding semi-truck. On May 14th and 15th, the community of Ludlow came to the aid of the shocked and grieving family, and Judd Crandall helped the parents make funeral arrangements. Dr. Creed selected the casket and the grave liner. On May 16th, a viewing was held at the funeral parlor. The casket was closed. An argument erupted between Dr. Creed and his father-in-law, Erwin Goldman. It led to a physical altercation that resulted in the casket falling over. Fortunately, the body remained concealed, but the event was nonetheless deeply upsetting to all in attendance. The funeral service was held on May 17th in Pleasant View Cemetery. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and comfort you and lift you up and give you peace. Amen. That evening, Lewis urged his wife to take their daughter and return to Chicago with the Goldmans. She agreed. On the morning of May 18th, Dr. Creed escorted his family to the airport. It would be the last time he would ever see his daughter. Based upon a receipt later found in his pocket, Dr. Creed went to Watson's Hardware and purchased the following. A flashlight, a pick, a shovel, a long-handled spade, rope, work gloves, and a canvas tarp, items essential for digging a grave or for robbing one. According to the witness testimony of Dory and Irwin Goldman, their granddaughter suffered from a panic attack during their flight to Chicago. Apparently, the girl had experienced a nightmare that involved the young man named Victor Pascal, the patient who died in Dr. Creed's medical facility. And according to Mrs. Goldman, Rachel became convinced that the girl's dream was a premonition, and she became desperate to prevent something terrible from happening. Minutes after landing in Chicago, Rachel Creed made several collect calls. Dr. Creed did not answer his home phone, and he was not at work. Rachel then contacted Judd Crandall. We don't know what was said, but after the call and after seeing her parents to their house, Rachel resolved to return to Ludlow as soon as possible. Reluctantly, Irwin Goldman drove Rachel back to the airport. She caught a flight from Chicago to New York, and then from New York to Boston, which arrived at 11.12 p.m., 15 minutes behind schedule. She missed her connecting flight to Bangor, so she rented a car from Avis. She drove the Chevette from Boston to a rest area in Biddeford, Maine, and again called Crandall from a payphone. She stopped again at a 24-hour truck stop in Pittsfield. According to the missing persons investigation, a woman matching her description was distressed over a car that wouldn't start. A good Samaritan truck driver reattached her battery cable. The woman thanked him profusely and got back on the turnpike, headed toward the Bangor area. The trail of Rachel Creed seems to end near her home. The rental car was found parked not in the Creed driveway, but in front of the smoldering remnants of Judd Crandall's house. This was the morning of May 19th. In the early stages of the blaze, the firefighters rushed to the scene, but they were not able to extinguish the flames before the entire two-story structure collapsed in on itself. There were many onlookers that day. Almost the whole neighborhood came out to witness the destruction, but Louis Creed, who was at home at the time of the fire, was not among them. One of the neighbors found the Creed's cat, Winston Churchill, dead on Judd's lawn. The animal had died not from the fire. Forensics would later discover that the cat had been injected with a massive dose of morphine. On the afternoon of the 19th, police interviewed Dr. Creed 
asking if he had noticed any suspicious activity before the Crandall fire took place. Dr. Creed wore a hat and jacket standing outside his house and stated that he had seen nothing out of the ordinary. By May 20th, fire investigators had uncovered the body of Judd Crandall, though the remains were burnt almost beyond recognition. His body had been soaked with gasoline, and according to the autopsy report, Judd did not die from the fire, but from blood loss. Also found in the crime scene, a scalpel stuck into a floorboard, a doctor's surgical tool. It was time for the detectives to pay another visit to Lewis Creed. They knocked on his door, no answer. They peered into the window. The kitchen floor was covered in blood. Dr. Creed sat slumped at the breakfast table. He had been stabbed over a dozen times. His hair had turned white. His glassy eyes staring at an unfinished game of solitaire. Though many of the townspeople believe that Dr. Creed took his own life, there are substantial clues to suggest otherwise. The first are muddy footprints from the entrance into the kitchen, and then there is the murder weapon, a butcher knife taken from the kitchen counter lodged in the doctor's chest between two ribs. The fingerprints on the handle of the blade match that of Rachel Creed. Also taking place on the same day, search and rescue operations had been scouring the woods, hoping to find Mrs. Creed alive. The only trace they found of her was a bedsheet caught on the branches of the deadfall next to the pet cemetery. The sheet was stained with massive amounts of blood, blood that matched Rachel's type. As authorities raked through more of the ashes of Judd's home, they found pieces of floorboard that had been spared from the blaze. They were soaked with that same person's blood. This indicated that at some point before the fire, Rachel had been inside Judd's home and had been injured. Finally, one last grisly detail was uncovered in the wreckage. The remains of a child, seemingly burnt beyond recognition at first, but the forensic evidence would go on to reveal that the body had been dead for nearly a week. More than that, there was formaldehyde and other signs of embalming. Ultimately, it dawned on investigators that the child might in fact be Gage Creed, stolen from the Pleasant View Cemetery. The grave was exhumed to confirm this theory. The boy's casket was empty, with the exception of a single spade recently purchased from Watson's Hardware. Detectives determined that it must have been Lewis Creed who was responsible for robbing his own son's grave. And now they scoured the late doctor's house, looking for any signs of motivation aside from the obvious grief. Among the doctor's books and papers, they found this, a note written by Judd Crandall. In addition to holiday pleasantries, it reads, by the way, Lewis, I wouldn't talk about what we did last night either. Not around North Ludlow. There are other people who know about that old Micmac burial ground. And there are other people in town who have buried their animals there. You might say it's another part of the pet cemetery. But people around here don't like to talk about it. And they don't like people they consider to be outsiders to know about it. Not because some of these old superstitions go back 300 years or more, although they do, but because they sort of believe in those superstitions and they think any outsider who knows that they do must be laughing at them. We will talk more about this probably tonight. And by then you will understand more. But in the meantime, I want to tell you that you did yourself proud. I knew you would, Judd. The authorities and news reporters began to assemble a narrative of their own. Judd Crandall had convinced the otherwise sensible Dr. Creed that the secret burial ground hidden in the hills was real and contained 
the magical power of resurrection. Perhaps the cat Winston Churchill had become lost or injured, or seemingly dead or missing, and then upon the feline's return over Thanksgiving weekend, Lewis Creed became a true believer. The theory continues. After the funeral of his son, Dr. Creed exhumed the little boy's corpse, then took it to Judd Crandall's home, demanding that the elderly man show him the way to the burial ground. Judd must have stalled for a while, perhaps even sent a warning over the phone to Rachel, who then immediately fled Chicago back home. Finally, when Judd could not bring the boy back to life, Dr. Creed stabbed the 84-year-old man over a dozen times with his scalpel. It's possible that Rachel may have entered the home during this murder, and either by intention or accident, Lewis stabbed Rachel as well. Believing her to be dead, he wrapped her in a sheet and took her up into the woods, perhaps placing her near the pet cemetery. Then he returned to the scene of his crime and burnt down the Crandall home hoping to destroy all evidence. But that night, Rachel Creed, still very much alive, walked into the kitchen to put her husband down like a mad dog. That's the theory, at least. And really, what else could have happened? Unless... Of course, one believes in local superstition. But that theory does leave an important loose end. Where is Rachel Creed? Over the weeks, she went from being a missing person to presumed dead. As far as detectives are concerned, they believe that after killing her husband, she fled back into the woods and died from loss of blood. And yet, no canine unit could find or follow her scent. And her body was never found, at least not by the authorities. But there are those who live in Ludlow who claim they have seen Rachel, usually just before dawn, or sometimes right after sunset, limping back and forth along the road where her son lost his life. They say she is still searching for Gage William Creed, calling out not his name, but a term of endearment, a single word in the darkness, darling, darling. Thank you for watching and listening to the Stephen King Book Club. As always, we appreciate your enthusiasm for this project as we go through the books and stories of Stephen King. Thank you for liking and subscribing, and thanks to all who have joined as members and become constant watchers as well as constant readers.